Good morning to everybody who uh, signed in for the seminar today. Uh, the seminar is AV over IP, getting up to speed. We are going to cover basic concepts of video streaming, video and audio over IP, and touch briefly on control. Uh, the seminar grew out of a class I've been teaching at Infocom for the last few years, and I see that the interest has uh, increased greatly uh, in this topic, so it's very timely. Uh, the goal of today's class is to bring you up to speed on the fundamentals of sending AV signals over a network uh, using an IP structure, uh, terminology involved with video compression, some of the protocols that are used when we stream media, and we'll talk very briefly uh, about some real-world applications at the end of the presentation, how we put this all to work. So let's get started. Um, Okay, we have an issue here right away. Can't advance my slides. There we go. So um, this used to be very easy, as you all know, in the good old days. Um, we had a handful of video formats we had to deal with. Uh, composite video, one jack. S-video, two jacks. Component video, three jacks. VGA, five jacks. Okay, it really wasn't that difficult to move these signals around. We just needed to add a distribution amplifier if we wanted to connect two or more monitors uh, to a video source. So we didn't worry a lot about bandwidth because the video that we were working with was pretty low frequency, low clock rate, uh, low bandwidth stuff. But then it started to get complicated. Uh, all of a sudden we needed to connect more than two monitors. Sometimes we needed to connect three or four monitors. Sometimes we needed to use more than one wire, two wires, three wires, sometimes five wire connections. Distribution amplifiers wouldn't do, so we had to put matrix switches in. And at that moment, we created the era of big hardware, as you see on the bottom. How big could they get? 64 by 64, 128 by 128 matrices. So we could get really, really big, uh, distributing up to five signals at the same time. And then it got complicated. Back in the late 90s, the digital video interface made its debut. Uh, this was designed to be a digital replacement for the VGA connector, which, by the way, is almost 30 years old. Uh, it uses transition-minimized differential signaling, TMDS, if you've ever heard of that. It's not a disease. It's not a drug. It's actually a signaling format. And at the same time uh, DVI came out, all of a sudden we started to see higher resolutions. So we started to see wider screens, things like wide XGA, wide UXGA. We started to see 720p and 768p and 1080p resolution, SXGA+. So not only are we going digital, but the pixels on the screen are increasing. So now we have much more complicated digital signals with multiple wires to connect. And we also had to process some new things. We had to process display data stored in the monitor and the TV and the projector, something we call EDID. And also we had copy protection because now we're connecting things like DVD players and set-top boxes and that's known as HDCP. In the meantime, TV screens are getting bigger, monitors are getting bigger, projector resolution is going up, clock rates are going up. And now we're running signals over longer distances, so we have to restore the signal. So our big hardware got bigger and bigger. And then these guys showed up. Our industry, for whatever reason or another, better or worse, has been forced to accept and use a consumer-grade digital interface the high-definition multimedia interface, which was never intended for anything other than home use. It was designed to connect a Blu-ray player or a set-top box to a TV, maybe going through an AV receiver. Okay. It was designed to be more consumer-friendly. Consumers didn't like that big DVI connector with the screws on it. They wanted something they could plug in easily. Okay. But we kept that big box hardware philosophy that we had from before. Well, upgrades to HDMI came hand in hand again with ever increasing clock speeds, higher resolutions, greater color bit depths, and now we had embedded audio formats that had to be supported. Who wants to pay the licenses to Dolby and DTS to support these formats? And now we have metadata present in the connection, and that metadata can be everything from just basic display data to high dynamic range, which is now coming to market. 720p and 1080i evolved to 1080p, and we added more computer resolutions, 1200p and wide UXGA. And the boxes kept getting bigger and bigger and more unwieldy. So we kind of think it's time to stop the madness. We're sort of going off the rails here with this ever larger hardware intensive uh, and in some cases almost proprietary approach to this. 
because now we have Ultra HD. We have 4K to worry about and even higher resolutions. We now have 5K monitors coming to market. We're seeing prototypes of 6K monitors, and I'm sure you've all heard about 8K resolution. We have a new version of high, defi high uh, definition digital copy protection 2.2. It works a lot faster than the old one. It will complicate matters a lot. The edited information, the display data channel information is more critical than ever to making a reliable connection. Clock rates are getting pushed to 600 megahertz and beyond. We require new classes of HDMI cables now that we're talking about doing UHD and 4K. So our backward compatible thinking has created some real hardware monsters, but what we're gonna say today is maybe we really don't need those hardware monsters. So what if? Here's some what ifs to think about. What if we convert everything to a digital signal as we do now? Okay, will it simplify matters? Well, certainly it does if we can have everything travel as packets in one wire. If we use an existing network, it can be an IT network or it can be a network that runs on an IT structure, then we don't need to run extra cables. Well, yes, that's a good idea. If our network's fast enough, can we multiplex IT traffic with video, audio, and control signals? Well, we can. And if we're smart enough to use fast category and optical fiber cables, can we enhance bandwidth and distance? And what if this was really all we needed to switch an AV signal? This is just a signal, a Cisco 48-port gigabit layer 3 switch. That's it. Maybe we don't need those big racks of proprietary HDMI switching and hardware. Maybe all we need is one of these and some video encoders and decoders. So guess what? We can. We can convert everything into a digital signal to simplify matters. We can use an existing network. We don't need to run extra cables. We have to make sure our network will be fast enough, and that shouldn't be a real challenge nowadays, to multiplex IT traffic with video, audio, and control. And we should be smart enough to use fast category and optical fiber cables to enhance bandwidth and distance. It is time to get with the program. Fiber, optical, and fast category wires. So, that all sounds great, and you're probably wondering, okay, Pete, how can we do that exactly? Well, let's take a look at the building blocks of it, and let's start with video compression. This is the key to making it all work. Any analog signal can be sampled and compressed. You can do this in a, in a very good way. You've, you've no, dirt, no doubt you've heard lousy audio, digital audio, and you've heard really good digital audio. The quality of the final signal, video and audio, depends on what the bit depth of the sampling is. The greater the bit depth, the more samples we take, the larger the file. The shallower the bit depth, the fewer the samples we take, the smaller the file. So the bit depth determines the file size and bit rates. Compression reduces file sizes and bit rates. And now that gets us into our first quandary. And this is a decision that only you can make as you design an AV over IP network, and that's your quality of service. What picture quality do you need? Audio is not necessarily as critical, but video quality is, because the screens that we're looking at are getting larger and larger. So any defects in the compression will be readily available and readily perceived. On the right side, you see 8-bit RGB with light compression, and then you see heavy compression, which is a softer image. So there's several different ways we can do this. Okay, a very, One very common way is something called JPEG, which stands for Joint Picture Experts Group. This is widely used for still images. It runs on all operating systems. It's a very efficient compression system. It's based on what's called discrete cosine transform. It can cause blocky picture artifacts with high compression, but it's a universal compression format. But a more souped up version of it may be appropriate for us. It's called JPEG 2000. And this is widely used for digital cinema. When you go see a digital cinema film, it is compressed using JPEG 2000. So it is the DC Digital Cinema 1.0 standard. It's based on a form of sampling and compression called Wavelet, not DCT. What's cool about it is it can support multiple resolutions of the same frame. So you can almost think of it in terms of flip movies. When you were bored in school, you take a bunch of pieces of paper, staple them together, and draw something on it, and you do flip movies. Well, that's basically what JPEG 2000 is. It gives you high-quality video reproduction, but the bit rates are also going to be very high. So JPEG 2000 gives you high-quality video compression with low latency. Latency is the delay between the time you send the signal and the time it's actually received and viewed and heard. It does require a high bit rate for HD, typically 50 megabytes a second and up. It does not use intermediate frames like MPEG, which we'll discuss in a moment. All the frames in a JPEG 2000 stream are keyframes. By that, I mean all the picture information is present in every frame coded from wavelet sampling at different resolutions. There's no support for audio in JPEG 2000. You have to use a separate codec for audio. So that could be MP3, could be the advanced audio codec, whatever you choose to use. 
you can take JPEG 2000, you can put it into a standard IT network and it can travel with IP headers. Now Kramer makes a JPEG 2000 encoder. Uh, this is very good for digital signage. It will not work with anything that has copy protection on it, but it takes an HDMI signal, converts it to JPEG 2000, streams it at a high bit rate. Now, video compression formats. These are specifically designed for video. Very common one is Motion JPEG. Motion JPEG is a video compression format which video each video frame or an interlaced field of a digital video sequence, if you're using an interlaced source, is compressed separately as a JPEG image. This is widely used by everything from digital cameras and IP cameras to webcams, supported by QuickTime, Safari, Google Chrome, and Mozilla Firefox. Maximum compression is about 20 to 1. It also uses a discrete cosine transform process and it's motion independent. But the one you're probably more familiar with is MPEG, the Motion Picture Experts Group. MPEG-2 has been around since the 1990s, originally developed for DVDs, digital TV, digital cable, and direct broadcast systems. It was standardized in 2003 for Blu-ray, IPTV, and BYODs as H.264. That's the advanced video codec. So this is a, a step up from what MPEG could do to improve the compression ratio, reduce the bit rates, and increase the data flow. And we have a new codec out. I'm not going to discuss it today because it warrants its own discussion. And that's high efficiency video coding, H.265. This was standardized in 2013. Digital TV, ultra high def TV, internet protocol TV, bring your own devices. And then there's Google uh, with VP9 and there's also VP10. This is a freeware uh, decoder. If you watch video on YouTube, it's encoded using VP9. This standard was released in 2013, but again, this is basically something that, when I say standard, it's proprietary as far as Google is concerned. And it's very similar in the way that it works to HEVC. Hand in hand with those, we have several audio compression formats. Uh, MP3 is probably the best known one. This was actually published as MPEG-1 Layer 3 Audio back in 1993, so now you know where the term MP3 comes from. It's a very widely used codec. Uh, we have proprietary codecs like Dolby Digital. This was first used in 1992 for cinemas, for digital audio tracks. When Jurassic Park came out, uh, we had something called DTS Digital Surround. That's a, another proprietary compression format. And then we have the Advanced Audio Codec, uh, announced in 1997. This is part of the MPEG standard. Typically, when you stream audio uh, with an MPEG, you will use either MPEG MP3 or use AAC. Uh, decoders will recognize these. They don't require a license. Dolby Digital and DTS do require specific licenses from uh, those two companies, and they're primarily used for home theater applications. So you might ask, why should we use compression? Well, think about this for a minute. A single 1080p HD video frame has 2,073,600 pixels in there. And if you take those and convert those to bytes and multiply it by RGB, which is three colors, you have 6,220,800 bytes. And one byte is eight bits of data. So if we're going to refresh that 60 times a second, we would need an uncompressed data rate of three gigabits a second to show 1080p video. The nominal data rate, though, for 3G HTSDI is 2.9 gigabits a second. That's very, very close. We don't always have a pipe that big. So we need to compress the signal uh, with some degree of efficiency to get it through smaller pipes. So how does that work exactly? Well, a video encoder is a very clever mathematical machine. It's a computer running at very high speeds. It does a tremendous amount of processing power. It has an enormous CPU in it, lots of memory. What it's basically doing is it's watching video before it makes compression decisions. So here's a video uh, that I shot in uh, Venice a few years ago. And in this frame, the background isn't changing here. We're standing on a dock watching all these different gondolas pull up. The boats are moving left to right. The water's moving in many different directions, as are the specular highlights. And there's a little bit of motion in the background. So the video encoder is doing two things. It's looking to see what's changing within a frame, that spatial correlation, and what's changing from one frame of video to the next, and that's temporal correlation. So all video encoders use these two processes. They're looking at spatial correlation and temporal correlation, and they're making compression decisions based on what they see changing from one frame to the next. So in an encoder, we take all that information and we reduce it to motion and static elements. Now on the right, this is sort of a recreation of what you would see coming out of an encoder, but the motion elements are standing out against the static elements of the video frame. The reason you see the buildings in the back is the camera's not 100% steady. 
So the sky isn't really changing. So that just appears to be a solid gray. But the boats are moving. The gondoliers are moving. People on the boats are moving. The water's moving. The specular highlights are moving. So if you'll notice in this frame, we have a, a little girl playing a violin. And uh, we take a look at the very bottom. And we see that we see her hand moving. We see the bow moving. We see her moving a little bit. We don't see really anything changing in the piano or the background. So here's the beauty of compression. What compression does is it looks to see what's changing from frame to frame and what's not changing to frame to frame. It takes what doesn't change and just re-encodes it and repeats it. It makes it redundant. It takes what does change and encodes that and refreshes that. And that's the beauty of compression. Taking what's redundant in the video frame and just copying and repeating it. So we do this by sampling and quantizing the video information into blocks of pixels that resemble the actual image. And these blocks of pixels are clustered into larger groups for transport, and we call them macro blocks. So in MPEG-2, a pixel block is 8 by 8 in size, and a macro block is two or more blocks combined. It's a very simple and efficient way to code video. Video encoders have come a long way in 25 years. They're very good at doing this. And here's what a block structure looks like. So here's an 8x8 block on the left, and you can see it's one section of a 2x2 two two macro block, which has 64 picture elements in it. Those of you who have digital cable, digital broadcast satellite, or any digital anything, where you see a momentary interruption in the signal, what do you see on the screen? You see little tiles. The picture appears to become mosaics. Those are the macro blocks. So we can reduce everything to a block structure. Now we want our encoder to be able to make decisions on the fly to determine how much compression we need. So we could come up with something called a group of pictures. Okay, this is one whole string of video frames made up of something called an iframe, which has no prediction, contains all the data in the frame. P frames, which predict in forward direction only, and B frames, which predict from previous and subsequent frames. So we have a cool thing going on here. We're looking forward before something's happening, and we're looking backwards. Okay, this is before you see it. This is where the latency comes in. So the longer we make the GOP, as we call it, it's not the grand old party, it's the group of pictures, that gives us the ability to have higher compression and greater transmission efficiency. We can have more channels of video. If we make the GOP shorter, then we can't compress as much and it reduces our transmission efficiency. A typical GOP, by the way, for broadcast is 15 frames. It's half a second. This way, if you lose a key frame, we have to wait 15 frames before you're recovered again. So the keyframe, the intercoded frame, is placed at 10 to 15 frame intervals, but you can make them longer. These are keyframes that serve as references for decoding of other frames. It contains all of the information in the video frame, everything, even the stuff that isn't changing. And they also serve as reference points for random access to parts of an MPEG program. So when you're skipping through a commercial with a DVR, what you're skipping through is iframes. When you're looking for chapter stops, on a DVR or an optical disc, you're looking for iframes. If you're searching for video on a computer, you're hopping from iframe to iframe. The next two frames we have are predictive P frames. These are predicting changes in a forward direction only. They look at the nearest I and P frames. They're never used as key frames. And then we have bidirectional interpolated B frames. These predict changes by looking forward and backward, and we never use those as key frames. So you can see where the latency comes in. In JPEG 2000, I said that we only use iframes. We're not looking forwards or backwards. We're just trying to do a little bit of compression on the signal, but every single frame contains all the information. So the bit rates are much higher. It's not very efficient. But with MPEG, because we add some latency, we can look forward and backwards and make, make decisions about how to compress things. We can achieve transmission efficiency and lower the actual bit, uh, streaming bit rates. So here's a graphic representation of how it works. We have a little guy uh, on a dirt bike hopping over a hill. The camera presumably is bolted down. It's not moving. The background's not moving. Maybe there's a little dust in the background. The only thing really happening is from frame to frame as the bicyclist is changing. So we start with a key frame, which is our iframe. And then we have three bidirectional interpretive frames. Then we have another, we have a P frame and then two more B frames uh, that are looking at it. So our encoder is constantly looking fac backwards and forward. It's doing mathematical calculations. It's got information that you've put into it and say, this is the quality of service I want. This is the bit rate that I want. And it's achieving the compression that you need to make this work. So let's compare MPEG and JPEG 2000. MPEG uses a lot of compression, typically. JPEG 2000 video is usually lightly compressed. So the bit rates for MPEG are going to be much, much lower than JPEG 2000. And as I said earlier, there's only a stream of iframes in JPEG. There's no P or B frames. 
plus in MPEG, since we are making some decisions and we are compressing, we have to use forward error correction. If we're streaming video over a network or any connection which we perceive to be not 100% reliable, we have to have forward error correction. We have to have enough time to recover all the data to restore the stream. So as we add P and B frames and then we extend the GOP length, we create something called latency. It's a delay. Uh, a typical delay, if you watched an analog video signal and then you watch a digital version of it, might be about a second and a half between the time you see the digital version and when the analog event happened. And of course, that can be changed. It depends on the GOP length. If you buy an encoder that's used for AV, typically the GOP length default is set up somewhere around 90 frames. So JPEG 2000 has low latency but high fixed bit rates. MPEG is much more complex and allows for bit rates, variable bit rates. So as you design a system, you need to take into consideration what your available bandwidth is and how much latency you can tolerate in the system. And that will determine which codec you want to use. So again, that's a decision you have to make, but you need to weigh all of these factors. Now, I talked about MPEG-2. MPEG-4 is really what's widely used in this industry. It was standardized in 2001. H.264 was announced in 2003. The goal was to cut the bit rate in half for equivalent image quality compared to MPEG-2, and this goal has been reached. One of the cool things about MPEG-4 is it can actually go intra frame and do compression, which MPEG-2 can't do. So this gives you greater efficiency for an equivalent GOP size. Let's say we want to have a 15 frame GOP, we want to cut the bit rate in half. By using AVC, we can do that. It also gives you variable block sizes, which you didn't have with MPEG-2, and multiple motion vectors as well as sub-pixel compression to one quarter of a pixel for luminance and one eighth of a pixel for chrominance information. AVC uses the exact same GOP frame structure, IPB, and adds a fourth frame called sub-pixel or SP. And you have all kinds of variable block sizes, 4x4, 4x8, 8x16, 16x16. All of these can be combined into a single macro block, and you have multiple motion vectors per macro block. One thing that 264 can do that MPEG-2 can't, it can look into neighboring macro blocks to make spatial prediction and make a compression adjustments accordingly. MPEG-2 can't do that, and that's what intra-frame intra -frame coding means. So how efficient is 264? Well, with MPEG-2, with a talking head, 2.2 to 4 megabits a second. With 264, that drops to 0.7 to 1.4. That's SD. With HD, it's about 2 to 6. So really what we're saying is we can do an HD uh, stream uh, with MPEG-4 before we can only do an SD stream with MPEG-2. Fraction video might be 4 to 7 megabits a second with MPEG-2. It could be 6 to 12 with, with H.264. The end-to-end -end latency really depends on the GOP length that you choose. The longer the GOP length, the greater the latency, but the better the forward error correction and the more reliable the signal transmission. So in real use, we don't widely use MPEG-2 in our industry except where we're setting up a system where we're streaming video content from broadcast and cable that was originated in MPEG-2, or it could be uh, playing off optical disk or some other format. Uh, we're much more likely to adopt uh, H.264 for a network. Again, 50% more efficient than 2, but it is more complex encoding than JPEG-2000, so your encoder hardware is going to cost more as a result. Now, both MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 allow dynamic adjustments to bitrate based on network speed, network conditions, and video content and resolution. These are all factors to be considered when you're determining your quality of service. And I can't stress that point enough. As you set up a network, you have to choose your bandwidth. You have to design the network to have enough bandwidth. You have to determine what size your displays are going to be, how many of them that you have to hit, how far away they are, uh, what kind of network speed you can assume to be reliable, uh, are you going just on a local area network? Are you going to try to go through a, uh, an outside uh, server and into a wide area network? What's the content? How much motion is in it? What's the resolution? All these things play into considering what your quality of service is. And of course, every piece of consumer electronics nowadays supports AVC playback. Smart televisions, set-top boxes, Blu-ray players, streaming media devices, Roku, Apple TV, all of these things support AVC playback. So it is a universal codec, and that's why it's the safe choice for most of the applications that you're going to use. Kramer has an MPEG-4 encoder-decoder set. Uh, the KDS-EN3, KDS-DEC3 are used to uh, encode and decode streams. Again, uh, these are using HDMI input, uh, but it can't be copy-protected material. 
Uh, these boxes do give you uh, quite a bit of control over the adjustments. Uh, they do have to work with a device that will assign uh, dynamic host control protocol addresses. Uh, that can be a domain name server, it can be a router, or whatever you want it to be. I demonstrated it at Infocom just using a standard off-the-shelf uh, router. And of course, they allow you to, to adjust the GOP length, whether you want to do constant bitrate encoding or variable bitrate encoding. So uh, there's a lot of adjustments you can make here to tailor these to fit the demands of your network. And we will talk about some of those adjustments in a moment. So we want to stream video over an IP network. <clears throat> we know how compression works. We know there are various choices that we have as far as a video encoder and decoder. Well, when we send MPEG over a network, or actually even if we broadcast or we stream it off an optical disk, there's three things in the stream. There's video data, which is encoded into packets. There's audio data, which is encoded into packets. And then there's something called a clock or more specifically, the program clock reference. This always has to be present in the stream. Otherwise, your decoder is not going to know what order to decode the packets and how to reassemble them to create a video and audio program. So the PCR typically contains the same address, hexadecimal address, as the video, because it's your sync. It's your digital sync. So in an MPEG packet, everything travels in one data stream. So video, audio, and clock data is sent as 188-byte packets. That never changes. Now, imagine yourself working in a post office. And this is a very highly automated post office. And it has an assembly line of conveyors flying by. And you have thousands of envelopes or millions of envelopes a second going by you that all look the same. But our post office is actually able to sort these out and send them to the right place. Well, it's because each one of those envelopes has a specific packet identifier, or PID, as we call it in the industry for short. And they work like barcodes on an envelope. The PID identifies the video and audio. It contains the clock information or the program data. Okay? And what happens is at high speed, our MPEG decoder rips those envelopes open, takes the packets out, and puts them into bins to create a program. And the cool thing about this is now we can associate different PIDs together to do different services. So let's say we want to do a single video cast, but we want to support multiple language tracks. So what we do is we send out video, and when we assign our programs, we say, use this video PID. And by the way, you can create multiple programs by assigning different audio PIDs with that same video PID. Now we can have a program that's transmitted in English, Spanish, Chinese, German, French, Russian, whatever we want it to be. And when we tune it in, we just tune in the particular MPEG program with those desired PIDs, and we can watch in the language that we want. We can also send out surround audio with two different video formats, or we can send out video with multiple audio formats, standard two channels, or different surround audios. Again, it's all based on the PIDs. The encoders will encode these PIDs correctly, and the decoders will decode this correctly, but you have to have this information present in the stream to make any of this work. So here's what an MPEG packet actually looks like. Each one is 188 bytes. The data payload is about 188, 184 bytes. There's an optional adaptation field if you need it. And then the necessary headers. So the sync, transport priority, payload error indicator. And the PID, the PID is very, very important. If there's any scrambling present, that's where it'll be. And then a continuity check. So as the MPEG uh, packets are streaming, there's a continuity check. There's an accountant in there who's keeping track that they're coming through in the right order and everything is in the right place and needs to be where it is. So video and audio files are first sampled and compressed. Compressed files are then coded into packets. These packets use different transport protocols with IP addressing. So there's two different concepts here. We have an MPEG stream and MPEG has its own protocols. Okay, it has PIDs, it has uh, numbers, and it has tables to associate them together. So when you send out an MPEG program, you have a map table and an association table. One is your parts list, one is your assembly instructions. So the association table, your map table rather, is your parts list. That tells you which different pieces of the stream you need to put together to create a program that actually you can watch and hear. And then how you build those is in your association table. So once we take all that MPEG stuff, now we need to put it in a different envelope, a bigger envelope, and that is our IP envelope. So we take the MPEG packets, and we assign a transport protocol to it, and we use IP addressing, and then it can sail through our network. And it can travel over any access network. So we can use wired, Ethernet, 
asynchronous transmission networks, optical networks, coaxial networks, or wireless, 802.11, WiMAX, or some proprietary standard. This way, we can view this on any TCP IP compatible platform. So again, Apple TV, Roku, internet TV, streaming media players, set-top boxes. All of these will work. All they need to be able to do is decode the MPEG formats that you use for compression. So here's where things get tricky, and this goes back to our quality of service issue. TCP IP is based on the principle that as long as all the packets get there eventually, the order of them isn't really all that important. They just need to get there. So if I send you a file, and that's a Word document, or it's a photo, or it's a spreadsheet, it may be that not all those packets travel through the same server to get to you, okay? But eventually they will get to you. And when they get to you, they're reconstituted into a file or an email or a photo or something that you can see, and you can watch it. Now, there's some latency introduced there out of necessity because in TCP IP, we have error correction. If we don't get a packet, uh, we ping and we ping and we ping until we get the packet sent to us. We ask to repeat them. Well, that's great. That random access system works really well. It has to negotiate congestion and shared bandwidth networks doesn't work really well with video and audio. Video and audio packets have to arrive in sequence. Okay, otherwise, you can't watch them. You just have gibberish. So we have two possible solutions here. The number one solution, which is the best one, is to design a private network with a high quality of service for our, our streaming media uh, connections. And that's the way I advise everybody to go. If you're going to do this, build your own network if you can. If you can't, and you're going to have to put your stuff on a, for, on a public network, then you need to use forward error correction because your packets are going to collide with everybody else's packets. You know, their spreadsheets, their files, their photo of the birthday party for their, their little daughter that weekend. It's all going to collide with your video. When we do that, we add a, a fair amount of buffering to allow reassembly of packets, and that creates latency, which is a delay, and it may be necessary with constricted bandwidth. So it is a challenge to implement HD IPTV over a public network. So here are the network transport protocols that you're most likely to encounter. Uh, the first one is user datagram protocol. This is one that works really, really well for video and audio. Sometimes it can have a problem getting past the firewall. That does require very accurate timing at both ends when you're streaming. Transport control protocol is so widely used, it has much less trouble getting through firewalls. It's again part of TCP IP. So we use it every day to send emails, files, and everything else. Uh, Real-time transmission protocol is better suited for video and audio streaming because it does assign a priority to the packets to ensure that they arrive in the correct order and that you can actually watch a coherent video and video stream with audio. A variant of this is real-time streaming protocol that runs with TCP headers that gets it through firewalls. So RTSP is something that you'll often see with video streaming and it will be set up automatically in the encoder. You can go in there and you can change it to a different protocol, but the default will typically be something like RTTP or RTSP or UDP. So for example, in the Kramer encoder I showed you before, the EN3 and the DEC3, the default protocol is user datagram protocol because it's so widely used. Another one is called MPEG Dash. This is real-time video streaming as HTTP files. Uh, you've heard of something called HLS, HTTP live streaming. This is very popular with Apple products and PEG dash basically works the same way. So it encodes, it encodes short sections of the video stream as HTTP files to, in different bit rates to maintain a quality of service. Why would we do that? Well, it may be that one of the bit rates we'd like to watch is not sustainable by the network, so we switch to a lower bit rate and lower resolution video. And again, I should emphasize here as we're going through, there will be handouts available of all this, so if you forget these terms, don't fret about it. Again, the purpose of this seminar is to understand what these terms are what they mean. So there will be handouts available to participants. So an IPTV packet structure is the same as other TCP IP packets. If you look in the upper right, you'll see a bunch of MPEG packets right above the Ethernet payload. And then we have our headers. So we have an IP header, we have a user, a UDP, a Universal Datagram Protocol header, a real-time protocol header, an Ethernet header. All of those add to about 66 bytes. The MPEG transport stream packet's always 188 bytes in length, and you can have up to seven of those traveling in one Ethernet frame at the same time. So that brings us back to the B word. And this is something that we always have to deal with is bandwidth. Um, and people will tell me there's never enough of it, 
and it's always too expensive. And that's largely true. So here's the conundrum that everybody faces, and it doesn't matter whether you are a private university streaming or you are DirecTV or you are uh, Google or, or uh, YouTube or something. Um, you have an investment in this system, okay? For a lot of people, there's a profitability issue there. There's, there's a cost issue, okay? So there's an emphasis on that on one side, but on the other side, you can go out and you can buy a really big TV right now. You can install really large monitors with high resolutions in classrooms and in meeting rooms. You can put them in your home. So um, you have a display capable of showing, in some cases, you know, uh, tens of billions of pixels. So you have an image quality issue at the receiving end, and you have an emphasis on ROI and managing the costs on the transmission end. And we know that bandwidth is difficult and costly to upgrade. It's not a, just a matter of saying, flip a switch, I want more bandwidth. You have to build enough of it into your network. So the solution here really is better video compression. So how do you calculate bandwidth? Well, as a longtime ham radio operator, we used to run into this problem all the time, which is we have to operate a signal at a certain frequency. How much bandwidth do we need? The rule of thumb is to add 3 dB, double your headroom. So whatever you think you need for bandwidth, you really want to have twice that. And actually for streaming, if you're going to do streaming of multiple multiple video streams, you might even want to double it again. It's not always easy to do, but it's hard to predict how many video streams will be present in the network, but generally the rule of thumb, 3 dB. So for bit rates, a uh, very highly compressed video, 300 kilobits to maybe 20 megabits a second, uh, and that would even be doing UHD with H.265. You can actually stream it in the range of 15 to 20 to 25 megabits a second. Right now, Netflix is doing 4K, and they're claiming that you need 15 megabits a second to be able to stream uh, the image that they're sending out. Audio is not as demanding, typically 64 kilobits to 384 kilobits a second. 384 is the bit rate for Dolby Digital 5.1. So again, rule of thumb, 3 dB. Whatever you think you need, double it. Now, I mentioned constant versus variable bit rate encoding earlier. Uh, why would I want to do this? Well. That's another one of those things where you have to decide how reliable is my network and how am I going to stream things to people at a sufficiently high enough resolution that I have decent picture quality. Constant bitrate encoding is always the best for the highest quality of service. Okay? If you have control over the network and you're building the network, you always want to use CBR. Variable bitrate encoding is one of these things where you don't have control over the network, so you're going to lower and raise the bitrate depending on what the network tells you it can support. The problem with that is you may lose packets along the way. So you have to have more forward error correction, which introduces more latency. So again, this is sort of like juggling puzzle pieces around trying to figure out what's the best combination for what you're doing. Now here are some IPTV streaming modes that are fairly advanced, but all these are accessible if you're going to use a, a video encoder. And here's why you would use them. So the first one is multi-bit rate streaming. In this case, your system bandwidth is adequate. You're on a local area network. You design the network. You know what the bandwidth capacity is. But different viewers may require different stream sizes. So you have people watching on a PC. You have somebody watching on a mobile device. Somebody's going through a set-top box. Somebody has a network television. You can also do something called dynamic stream shaping, DSS. Your point-to-point -point bandwidth may fluctuate in the network. So the encoder will adapt based on what it's seeing from the network, the back pressure, it will adapt to, as needed to maintain a specific quality of service level. You'll, you'll pick the lowest quality of service possible and say you can't go below that, but you can go above it. So your encoder will say, thanks, I have that leeway, I will make those adjustments on the fly. And then you have adaptive bitrate streaming. You really don't have any control over network connections. This is talking about going over a wide area network. So if you think about getting video from, from Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or one of these other streaming services, and, and this is one of the reasons why most of these uh, guys are actually installing server farms and streaming uh, near large metropolitan areas. So when you watch a Netflix movie, it's not just coming out of a server in San Jose. It could be coming out of a server in Philadelphia or Minnesota or Houston or Atlanta. They're trying to get closer to you to cut down the network transmission distance so they can maintain a higher quality of service. So here's multi-bit rate streaming. This it requires a little bit more advanced encoding. And what's happening is your video source is being encoded to a number of different bit rates. Each one of those is formatted for a particular audience or a receiver or a network. 
So this is widely used in MPEG transport streams over local area networks. You know, the person who's watching on their laptop, the person who's watching on a tablet or a phone doesn't need to have the highest quality video because their screen is so small and they're sitting relatively close to it. So they can take a lower stream, say maybe one megabit a second. Uh, the set-top box might require something higher, maybe eight megabits a second. The desktop might only need two. The TV might also need six to eight megabits a second. And if you're doing a secure recording of what you're playing back, that needs to go at the highest bit rate possible. So that's a good example of how multi-bit rate works. Dynamic stream shaping is kind of cool because the encoder's video bit rate is listening to the network, okay? And the network is creating back pressure and saying, I can't handle a really high uh, bit rate. Give me something lower. So on the fly, the encoder will drop. And you may have seen this in the early days if you are, again, a Netflix or a streaming media subscriber that you're watching the program and all of a sudden for a brief second you might see the buffering signal or you'd see it freeze for a second and then all of a sudden the video continues but now it doesn't quite look so sharp anymore. Looks like it went to slightly lower resolution. What's well, exactly what's happening here is that your uh, streaming network has picked a lower resolution and it's probably because uh, there was too much network traffic. So the encoders giving the ability to raise and lower that, that uh, bit rate automatically based on uh, back pressure from the network used basically with uh, real-time messaging protocol uplinks. Another thing is adaptive bitrate streaming. And again, more sophisticated encoders will do this. So they will send out multiple different bit rates. Each device dynamically changes between streams based on available connections. So um, this is for final delivery over the internet, and this is typically used with a, a, a wide area network, something that's going beyond uh, your own individual network. So that brings us to the topic of a multicast. Um, when you watch a, a broadcast TV program, uh, most TV stations have a multicast. What that means is that they have more than one MPEG streams at the same time arriving at your set-top box. Okay. It works across any network or any transmission system because MPEG is a universal platform. And as we saw earlier, I can sit and mix and match like a cook. I can say, well, okay, I want to take this video stream and I'm going to combine it with that audio stream, and that's a program. Now, maybe my second channel of service will be a standard definition version of that HD program that was channel one, and I'll use the same audio, but now it's standard definition, and that could be number two. Or maybe number three is something totally different. It's a totally different video stream with a totally different audio program. Or it could be the same video stream with a different audio program. So that's a multicast. All of the video audio streams are present at the same time in the multicast. All you need is a software-based tuner to choose the different MPEG program that you need. The challenge there is being able to stay within your bandwidth budget. I used to call this a digital shoebox. You have a box that's only so big, and you have video and audio assets, how can you fit them in there and how can you create all these different programs without going outside the box? So in the cable, direct broadcast, broadcast world, multicasting means all the MPEG programs are present in one stream at the same time, but we use software tuning to tune them in. But in the world of uh, AV over IP, it's totally different. So multicasting means transmission of one stream and using networks to serve up multiple copies. So we use IP header tuning to do this. What happens in the server if we want to do a multicast, somebody dials in, the packets are copied for each end user by the network, the packets have special addresses reserved for multicasting, and there's no limit on the number of viewers who can join the multicast. In effect, right now, you are watching an IPTV multicast because you dialed in, and the server's assigning you a specific header, IP header, and you're streaming the packets listening to me, and you're watching my video. Now, anything we use in that signal chain, any routers we use, any uh, digital subscriber line access modules, anything, they have to be multicast compatible for this to work. And we use virtual channel and program numbers for all of this to make it easier. I can give you an IP address and say, enter this IP address, click on your, on your web browser and you're logged in, or I can give you a virtual channel and program number with a software tuned device and you just flip to that number, click on it, and bingo, you've joined the program. So here's a typical multicast. We have IPTV content. In this case, it's a weather broadcast. We're going into a server and somebody dials in on a TV that wants to watch the stream. So they get their own stream with their own packets. And then we have somebody who's trying to watch on a wireless device. Okay, well, they have their own stream and their own packets assigned to it. 
And then finally, we have an IPTV stream number three, which is going to a laptop. So uh, not all of the streams are available at the same time. It's just one stream that's sent to multiple devices. So it's sort of the opposite of, a, of an MPEG multicast for broadcast, where there are multiple channels you can tune in, all streaming at the same time. But with an IP multicast, what it means is that we're taking one and we're sending it to many. So we've kind of zipped through all of this, but I hope that we've covered a lot of the terms uh, that you're going to come across as you uh, consider putting these to work. And we will have follow-up webinars on a little bit more drill-down detail. But how will we put this to work? This is all fine and dandy, but you say, Pete, great. How do I can I actually use this? Well, I actually built the system in my class at Infocom, so let's talk about some very common applications here. This is all called software-based switching. You remember I started this by saying that we've gotten very, very immersed in this hardware-based switching world, and it may be time for us to consider jettisoning that and moving away from switching in hardware and switching in software. So with software-based switching, we can encode video or whatever is on our display with audio and metadata. We can put that into an MPEG format. We can also put it into a JPEG format, but let's focus on MPEG for the time being. We can assign IP headers to that, and we can switch that through a network. So any display that can get into the network and has an MPEG decoder can access the video and audio simply by looking up the IP address. Okay? So one encoder can feed numerous displays through a switch. Our connections can be structured wire. They can be optical. They can also be wireless. Now, wireless is a bit tricky because a lot of, a lot of wireless systems use spread spectrum and frequency hopping. So it, it, it takes a little bit more management to be able to stream video over wireless, but it can be done. And now what we can basically say is our transmission distance is only limited by the interconnects that we have. So if we build a wide area campus network, we can then stream video to anybody on that network, whether they're dialed in wirelessly or they have a physical connection to it. Okay, But we've eliminated that big box that we have to program to switch HDMI, audio, and video, and everything else that's going along with it, and control signals. We're just putting the video program out there and saying, switch it in software. And by the way, if this isn't the program you need to be watching, then you switch to a different address and you pick up the video and audio program coming off of that encoder. So here's a basic, very, very basic configuration. What we have is we have a Blu-ray player feeding a Kramer encoder, okay, an EN3. So this is our MPEG-4, maybe a standard 90-frame GOP. Maybe we're using variable bitrate encoding uh, because if the image that we're sending out is static video, we don't need to use a high bitrate. If it is a lot of motion video, then the bitrate goes up. But we're adapting the bitrate based on the content. We're sending that through a managed switch. A managed switch can actually assign DNS addresses. So it has to be able to assign addresses to everything that's connected to it so that it can find those devices and that they can find it. Out of that managed switch, we can feed a bunch of DE3 uh, decoders. So now what we've done is we've created a, basically a digital signage network. Where would I use this? I could put this in a sports bar. I could put this in the cafeteria at a school. I could put this in a student lounge. And what I really, all I need here is I need that switch. I need structured cable, probably CAT6, if I'm going to use higher bandwidth. And for every TV, I need a decoder. Now, if it's a smart TV, it has a decoder built into it, and all I need to be able to do is get into the TV, I need to pick a web address, go back to that switch, and bingo, I'm watching the video. So it's very simple. It's a switch, it's a bunch of decoders, a bunch of displays. Well, there's another configuration. I have a four possible inputs feeding a switch. So I have my Blu-ray player, a laptop, I have a digital TV tuner, I have a camera, who knows what I have here. So what I'm using here is a Kramer VS62HA. This is a uh, six input, two out switcher. So one of the outputs of this is going to a Kramer encoder, and the other one's going to a local monitor. Now this might be something I would use if I'm going to be doing a, a streaming cast from a classroom. So I wanna have that confidence monitor. I wanna have a local monitor confirming that I have a signal coming out of the switcher. The other output is going to the EN3, and again, we've encoded that, we've picked our GOP, we've picked which type of encoding we want, constant or variable, our bit rates, our latency, all that's been determined based on our quality of service. And now we're going through our managed switch, and we're feeding as many decoders as we need to. If we need to feed more decoders, we just need more ports on the switch. So, and that, that is not really a very difficult thing to do. So, um, those displays could be anywhere, they could be in another classroom, they could be in another part of the building, it's really up to you. But again, it's all being done in software. A third configuration 
is we now have four different things that are going directly into the switch. We're encoding the output of all these uh, video sources, and then we're taking the managed switch and we're going to different displays. So let's say display number one wants to watch what's coming off the Blu-ray player. Well, all it needs to do is it needs to dial in the address for the first encoder. And display two wants to see what's on the live camera. Now, that can be done by either entering that as a standard uh, HTML address, or it can be done with software-based tuning. And in a TV that's a smart TV, that's typically what you're doing. So you can actually just say, well, it's channel one, or it's channel two, or it's cafeteria TV, or it's classroom TV. You can call it whatever you want. That's the beauty of software-based switching. You can assign it a virtual domain and a virtual name. So the advantages of software-based switching, it's easily scalable. The only limit is network switch capacity. You don't need those big hulking pieces of hardware anymore. You do need switches, and you have to have enough switch capacity to make it work. The bandwidth is limited by the encoders, decoders, and the network. So you have to have enough capacity in your network to pass all the signals. Best practices, AV over IP systems can and always should sit on their own subnets, offering secure operation and access. This is so the IT guys don't freak out because AV equipment sometimes can scare them because you know people have access to it. What's really happening with it? Well, if you put it on its own subnet, then you're a sense, in essence creating a firewall, and it's easy to firewall either side of that subnet. Digital signage is a lot easier to do this way. Many smart displays and TVs already have the decoders built in. So all you really need is your source, your encoder, and your switch. You're using standard network and interconnects. So you don't really have any issues with HDMI, DVI, or, or a display port. It's just a standard video over uh, a network. Now, there are network protocols for copy protection that are very different than HDCP, but they do exist. Again, that's beyond the scope of today's seminar, but they are out there. Latency is determined by your encoding system. It's a choice you make. Am I using JPEG, JPEG 2000, Motion JPEG, MPEG, and your GOP length? But you can do very long cable runs with optical fiber interconnects. So now once I encode this to video, if I use multi-mode fiber, I can go up to three kilometers. I can go about a mile and a half. If I put this on single mode, I can probably go 15 miles if I need to. So I don't have the cable limitation problems anymore. And I can pack all kinds of stuff into that cable so I can put control system information there as packets, not just video and audio, and metadata. And of course, it can carry Ethernet and it can transport all my normal uh, internet traffic. So you don't need a proprietary system to do that. It just makes more sense on a lot of levels. So we've pretty much reached the end of the presentation, but I want to tie this all together and talk a little bit about uh, Kramer Network, because this is something new for the company. But we announced this at Infocom. And what is it? Well, it's really kind of a holistic view of looking at an entire network that it's an enterprise management platform that enables AV and IT managers to route, manage, control AV and streaming networks from any point anywhere in the network, or actually even outside the network. So what we're doing is we're mixing standard TCP IP traffic and AV and data and streaming and everything else. We can see it. We can control it. It features video using H.264. AVC encoding through a virtual switch matrix. For audio, we're standardizing on Dante, which is widely used. We can configure, manage, and control devices over a network. We can see encoders. We can see decoders. We can see things on the network, and we can assign addresses to them, and we can control them. We can automatically detect new devices as they're added to the network. We can view the entire network. We can look at sections of it to see how it's performing, what the bit rates are, what network traffic rates are. We can create a virtual matrix. We can even drill down to a room view. We can install it on a standard enterprise or virtual server, cloud server. And it's a web-based client, so it doesn't really care what the hardware is. It's totally hardware agnostic. And this is sort of a simplified diagram of all the different parts of it, AV over IP, traditional AV, uh, Kramer control, and an IT interface. So there's four parts to it, again. Streaming, video, and audio, which is what the focus of our seminar was today. Detecting, operating, and maintaining traditional AV devices, which those devices have uh, Ethernet ports. So you, they can be addressed. We can get in there. We can talk to them. We can control them. We can monitor them. Provides an IT interface into the network, and it provides container control of all devices. And all this is possible using a custom management software and a very user-friendly GUI, just like a standard web browser. It's, it's all object-oriented. It's very easy to use. So we can auto-detect encoders and decoders, customize site topology, click to connect to AV source. It really is that simple to multiple destinations. See devices and connections health status at a glance. 
scalable from a few devices to hundreds of devices. Easily create predefined scenarios and reuse them. So once you've built a matrix of AV connections, you can copy and paste that and reuse them to make hundreds of AV over IP connections with one click. This would be impossible to do with a hardware-based solution. I can't emphasize that enough. It would be a mechanical nightmare. It would require lots of money, lots of time, lots of installation, lots of investment. Over cloud-based, software-based switching, it's really not difficult to do at all. And you don't have to configure the IP network to make any of this work. So specifications, video bandwidth, 10 to 100 megabits a second. Medium compression, 10 to 100 to 1. Compression formats, motion JPEG, H.264 with real-time streaming protocol, straight up H.264. And again, coming JPEG 2000, but let's focus on these because these are the most efficient codecs. Video quality is medium, and, and latency is based on your adjustable GOP length. It's really up to you. Our solutions for H.264, the ENC, or excuse me, the EN3 and DEC3, and the EN4 and DEC4 for H.264 motion JPEG. And just to give you an idea of what the room view looks like, this is what you see when you log in. So again, it's all object oriented as far as being able to assign devices and assigning control for those devices. So it's very user friendly and it uses the power of the network, the cloud and the internet to make this all work. Again, software based switching. It's the wave of the future and the future is now. So that concludes the presentation. We have a couple minutes left for questions. And if I can find these. Let's open the Q&A panel. Um, we did have a question here. I'm not hearing anything. Something I can do. I can see the presentation. Uh, I hope everybody can hear this. Um, I know that we are getting audio out through um, uh, WebEx. So if we have any questions, um, if you can enter them now in the Q&A box, um, I'd be glad to take a few questions here. We're going to repeat this seminar at 2 o'clock, and I do want to emphasize that there will be a handout of the PowerPoint deck available for everybody that registered. This will be in a PDF format, two slides up on a page. So uh, it does not look like we have any questions at the moment. Let me just check our chat box. Okay. It looks like we had a few people that did not hear uh, audio. Okay, we should have audio here. Ian uh, wrote in and said, uh, we have a new building that will be perfect for IPTV network like this. Who can I contact for more info? Uh, we will follow up with you if you registered. Um, uh, you have your register information. Uh, please contact uh, the folks here at Kramer and um, we will uh, have somebody get in touch with you for more information. Okay, we have another question here. How's the encoder decoder configuration tool page look like? We can arrange to show you a demo of that. That shouldn't be an issue. Um, looking for a solution to classroom situation 32. PCs would like to be able to send instructor and student students to instructor. Yes, uh, we can do that as well. Um, I think probably the best thing to do since these questions are drilling down in a little bit more detail uh, is to have follow-ups. Uh, we will have somebody follow up uh, from you with Kramer. Um, uh, any other uh, questions about uh, what you saw today, at least as far as the basic topics, because that was our focus, was the uh, terminology and uh, the basics of compression. Will the PowerPoint be emailed? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, and one last question popped up. If we had a bar with 30 TVs and 10 satellite receivers, would you need to worry about bandwidth out of the facility or just put a network switch port? Uh, just the network switch port, because uh, the signal is going to be decoded from the satellite receivers uh, to MPEG, and you will choose the bit rate that you want. So as you outfit the room, you need to pick a bit rate, a working bit rate. Uh, the good news is right now that uh, switches are dropping in price. You can get one gigi and 10 gigi switches uh, relatively easily, and it's actually 40 gig switches now that are coming to market. Is there a more in-depth training or on-site certification on putting the entire system together from start to finish, including end user control? 
that is in the works. Yes, we will have classes on that. Uh, right now, again, our focus today was to give you the basics, so you understand the basic concepts. Uh, because once you have a command of that, I think you'll be more confident taking more in-depth training to understand how all of this works. So yes, that is coming, that will be available from uh, Kramer. So I'd like to thank everybody who tuned in today. Um, I hope we gave you a, it was somewhat quick, but a, a reasonably thorough tour through the world of uh, video compression, uh, streaming, MPEG, and the terminology that's required. And put, perhaps put a bee in your bonnet to start thinking about ways that you can build a software-based hardware switching distribution and ultimately a control system. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for participating. And uh, again, we will make PowerPoint decks available to everybody uh, that participated in the seminar. And uh, please feel free to uh, contact us. Uh, we will do a follow-up by email with the PowerPoints and, and pound us with questions because this is a very interesting topic. It is the way the industry is heading. Uh, inevitably, we're all going to go in this direction, all with software-based switching, and it's going to be a very exciting time for everybody. So uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, signing in, and that will conclude our presentation for the day.